Hi, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's having good tiff. Uh, I just wanted to thank Tom Powers and everyone for, for having us today. Um, my name is Adam Claff, and I run business development for VHX. And this is not me. This is Aziz Ansari. Uh, Aziz is a comedian. Uh, and in 2012, Aziz Ansari asked, uh, asked, contacted us because he wanted to sell a comedy special on the internet. He had a new hour comedy special, and he wanted to place it on his own website and offer it to his fans directly there. Uh, and he was inspired by another comedian named Louis C.K., who had done that about six months earlier. Uh, at the time, there was no real way, easy way at least, for Aziz to do that. Uh, Louis had hired an agency. Uh, he hired a company in Brooklyn to build something very custom for him, um, something that took payments, something that delivered downloads, <clears throat> something that uh, provided the audience data, uh, all in kind of a, a very branded experience. So he wanted to do the same thing. And, uh, and the co-founders of my company, uh, Jamie Wilkinson and Casey Pugh, were well-known uh, video nerds in New York. Uh, they had helped build sites like Vimeo and Boxy and KnowYourMeme.com. And uh, they got connected with Aziz, and they built it for him. And it was a huge success. So you could go to AzizOnsari.com, put in your payment information, and get the video from him. Uh, and Jamie and Casey thought it would be really cool if anybody could do that, uh, if you didn't need to be to have access to engineers or have a lot of money or uh, or, or kind of build these sort of very one-off experiences, so so they did, and they took that technology and they turned it into VHX, uh, and here we are two and a half years later. Uh, anyone can sign up, create a website, upload a video, set a price, and sell it to their audience. We've gone from uh, one release to 2,300. Uh, we have about $3.8 million in total revenue across the network. Uh, went from two employees to 21, all in Brooklyn. Uh, and all of this uh, data is available every day publicly on our website. Uh, we update our stats there uh, on a regular basis. And, uh, and what we do is we provide those tools. So the payments, the video, the analytics, and figuring out a better way to bridge that gap uh, between interest and availability. So someone that wants to buy something from an artist or from a distributor, being able to seek it out on the open internet and get it from them. Uh, so what is direct distribution? It's this a term that you hear a lot, and I think there's a lot of people you know, using this term. Uh, you know, uh, I think it's a little vague. I think like a lot of acronyms in direct or in digital distribution or VOD in general, the, uh, the definition of what it, of what it means uh, tends to vary depending on uh, you know the, the the filmmaker or the distributor or the lawyer you happen to be dealing with at that time. So, uh, so I just want to kind of clear up at least what we view direct distribution as, and uh, and I think a main kind of main component to that is that digital distrib or direct distribution and digital distribution are not the same thing. So digital distribution usually means this on the bottom, uh, all the logos uh, that you, that you normally see. Uh, and you know these experiences are generally uniform. Uh, you you can kind of uh, as a customer you know what to expect. All the content pretty much looks the same. It's pretty much priced the same. Uh, there's you know the being successful in those platforms generally has to do with things like placement or uh, or, or how to stand out in a sea of posters. Uh, and there's all kinds of mechanics to all those different platforms and all those different stores. We like to think that a lot of these marketplaces are essentially iterating on Blockbuster Video. Uh, I think, you know, you don't go to the video store anymore to rent DVDs, at least most of us. Um, but the experience, you know, I as, a, I as a fan, I as a consumer arrive, I pick something and then I leave, is essentially the same. And, you know, these marketplaces, while completely necessary, uh, and I think very effective in many ways, don't really go far enough. Uh, they don't really address the main benefit uh, of the internet, which is, uh, in our opinion, the, uh, the relationship between the creator uh, and the fan. Uh, direct distribution, on the other hand, 
takes advantage of that and is, and is built f outward from that relationship. Uh, uses the open internet as a delivery vehicle for your content, not just a marketing vehicle or an awareness vehicle leading to other marketplaces. Uh, it, it allows you to kind of ask the question, who is my audience, what do I have, and how do I get it to them, as opposed to only asking, who are my retailers, what do they want, and how do I please them? And so direct distribution generally looks like this. Uh, it's not cookie cutter, it's not cut and paste. Uh, the content could be priced differently, it could be different lengths, it could, uh, you know, it, it takes various forms. And uh, all of these websites have VHX embedded in them and they have a consistent checkout experience and a similar kind of streaming and downloading experience. But everything else with each of these artists is their own voice. Uh, and I think it's important to, to, to say that you know, we, don't, we don't say you should pick one D word over another. Uh, you know, I think it's important for, for all filmmakers to, to have all the logos, right? To kind of figure out what the best strategy for them is and, uh, and, and, and execute that. And that might be being in all those marketplaces. But what we advocate is for a more complete strategy, you know, making sure that, that if you have something to say and if you have something you want to deliver that you're you're giving as much uh, uh, energy to your voice as possible. So that's how we look at, uh, at direct distribution. And who can take advantage of this? Uh, anyone. Anyone that has video that's worth money and something to say to their audience can take advantage of this. It could be a filmmaker, it could be a distributor, it could be uh, someone in the education space, uh, it could be you know, a trainer, um, I think what we're seeing with this, and we'll get to this later as well, uh, is the opportunity to question some really basic assumptions of film distribution and to say, and to, and to take content in any form and really monetize it effectively. Um, so it sounds great, right? Just do all the things. Uh, but you know, the truth is a lot of people um, uh, you know, might be telling you not to. And I think, I think a lot of the, the common counter, counter arguments are you know, that it's too risky, uh, that you might upset your traditional partners, that you won't make any money. Uh, and if you want to sell something on the internet, it's obviously because nobody else wanted it, right? Uh, but those are all wrong assumptions, and, and, I th and we'll get into that in a second, why. Uh, I'd also like to say, you know, point out that documentary filmmakers and documentaries in general are probably the most primed to using this strategy for distribution than any other film content. Uh, engaging with community, uh, talking to your audience, a sense of authorship, a sense of ownership over your work that carries between projects, uh, creative ways of monetizing and fundraising and reaching out to different groups. These are all old hat with docs. All we're talking about now is using new tools to further amplify and leverage that. Uh, so why should you? Uh, I think you know, we can sum this up with three reasons, three, three kind of core reasons. The, the first is freedom. Uh, that could mean anything. It could mean, the, it could mean uh, Draft House and Josh Oppenheimer giving away the act of killing for free in Indonesia, uh, where it was otherwise banned or had to be secretly screened. Um, or it could be filmmakers uh, selling hours and hours and hours of extra material years after their film comes out, or, or kind of even at the same time, uh, uh, to, to further monetize and, and reach their audience. Uh, the second is data. Uh, specifically access and ownership of that data. Uh, you don't have to make guesses about your audience anymore. You don't have to rely on uh, hunches or samples or you know, just untested hypotheses. Uh, you, you can actually react in real time and get all of that data and, uh, and use it to actually improve your project uh, and, and also your future releases and I think you know, with, with access to that data, I think equally important is that you actually own that data. It's yours, and you can take it with you uh, to not only improve your project, but also to invest uh, in your career. Uh, crowdfunding is a good example of that, you know, where people are taking, sort of growing their campaigns, people that come back and do two, three, four crowdfunding campaigns and are able to leverage those lists as they grow. Um, if, they were to, if they had to start flat-footed every time, which I think everyone knows is, is kind of a, a recurring theme in film distribution, uh, they would be uh, really at a great disadvantage. Uh, the third is ubiquity, uh, giving the impression that you are everywhere. 
uh, I think the, the, the film business and the entertainment industry as a whole um, values scarcity and values exclusivity. Uh, the internet abhors scarcity. Uh, you have to sort of change your thinking there and, and instead of embracing scarcity, rather embrace abundance and embrace availability and ease of access and removing friction in every part of the experience possible. That doesn't mean that every single project you ever release needs to be day and date on every single platform in the world. Um, but rather what it means is look at all of the available options and think about how you can reach a complete audience uh, in as easy a way as possible uh, you know, um, uh, when you release your project. So the example I'm gonna go through is a documentary that came out uh, April 1 of this year. It's called Stripped. Uh, it's, uh, it's about the dying art of newspaper comics. Uh, and it features interviews with over 60 cartoonists uh, including Jim Davis from Garfield and Matt Inman from The Oatmeal and many, many more. Uh, it has an audio-only interview with Bill Waterson from Calvin and Hobbes, uh, who refused to, uh, to be on camera. He also drew the, uh, the key art for the film, too. Um, the guys that made this movie, uh, Dave Kellett and Fred Schroeder, are not famous. Uh, they're not Aziz. They don't have three million Twitter followers. Uh, what they had was they, they had two Kickstarter campaigns. Uh, uh, Dave... Uh, is a cartoonist and has, uh, has had some success in cartooning. He's been nominated for the Harvey Award and the Eisner Award and, um, and has kind of some resources there. And they used that to get some publicity for their campaigns. Uh, they did two campaigns, one during production, one during post. Uh, they raised about $185,000 from five backers, so definitely a very successful campaign. Um, when they released the film, they screened it theatrically at some festivals. They released it on DVD. Uh, they released it on iTunes and Google Play and they put it on their website. Um, and that is, is kind of how I want to start by talking about what they did on their site, which, uh, which addresses the first point of freedom. Um, on stripthefilm.com, there are 30 different packages available for sale for one movie. Uh, you can buy unedited 90-minute interviews with Jim Davis, uh, if you are a fan of his. Uh, you can buy behind the scenes, you can buy the extended cut. Um, those interviews are $2.99 each. Um, going all the way up to a $49.99 super deluxe edition uh, that features 16 hours of content. Uh, no discs, no physical goods, all digital. Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this, I think, is, is, is the key, right? Um, and, I, and I also should, should preface this by saying the filmmakers, when they put this film out, they knew they had to make a splash, right? And, and the best way for them to make a splash with a limited budget, no distributor, no real P&A, uh, in, their, uh, in their eyes, was to become the number one movie on iTunes. So what they did was, leading up to the release day, they, got, they, they messaged all of their backers, because they had those addresses, they had the, that, those lines of communication. Uh, they got everyone to tweet and everyone to share and say, day one, April 1st, buy the movie on iTunes. That is what we want you to do. Uh, and it worked. All those people bought the movie on iTunes, it shot up the charts, on, uh, on April 1st, it became the number one documentary on iTunes. And because of that, iTunes took notice. They gave it better placement. They, made a, they put it in the carousel. They put it as a featured doc. Uh, people who were coming into iTunes saw it there. Uh, they had the network effects, the feedback loops of being in the top 10 list. Uh, and they were able to really leverage that and maximize that. And then on day two, they stopped telling people to go to iTunes. They, they changed all of their messaging and all of their advertising to go to the website. And the website would lead you to DVD, lead you to iTunes, or lead you to, uh, to buy direct. And uh, uh, I think the, the, you know, it's worth noting that that was done in, in 24 hours. They, the, you know, the, the, the idea that they would have a 90-day window, or a 60-day window, or a 30-day window uh, is ridiculous on the internet. Um, you know, they, were, they were moving very, very fast, and they knew that their audience was going to move very fast as well. Um, so. So they offered all of these packages uh, on the website, and, uh, and we'll see how they did now. So the, um, the, as you can see, the, the $49.99 package, uh, while not the most popular in terms of sales, drew 48% of the revenue. Uh, I will address the elephant in the room, which is how much money did they actually make, uh, by saying that, that in total, the, the revenue on the VHX site was in the mid five figures. 
Um, so not the total, that's not the total piece of all of the revenue for the, for the film, but that's what we were talking about in terms of the site. And in their case, the site was really used as a way to monetize those, those ser serious fans. Uh, and we know that it monetized those serious fans because we have the data of who was buying what. Uh, when Strip did their Kickstarter campaigns, they offered, um, they offered a digital download as a reward, which is a very, very common you know, reward that you would do on an Indiegogo or Kickstarter campaign. Uh, and we fulfilled that for them. It's something that we do for, for crowdfunding campaigns, offer those people downloads. So since we had those email addresses of people that had fulfilled, uh, that, had, that had backed the film, we then were able to see if those people made follow-up purchases, uh, and they did. 55% uh, of all sales on this website were from people that had backed the campaign already. 55% of people that bought something had already given these people money. Uh, and, and I think, you know, when people talk about, uh, uh, you know, where you wanna, where you wanna go with your audience or where you wanna, what are your calls to action or w what is the value of your audience, you know, you don't really know that until you, until you really offer, uh, you know, create a, a rich offering for them to take advantage of. And I think in Strip's case, these were people that supported, that supported the Dave and Fred, they supported the film, and they weren't necessarily just looking to, to have that transaction or to have that, you know, that sale and then move on and, and, and sort of never return. Um, these guys were able to leverage that relationship and further monetize their audience. Uh, the other 45% of people that bought something on the site, we have no idea where they came from. Uh, there were some referrals, but, but um, you know, there were, there were, they either came directly to the site or they came from social media. But, um, but those people that bought just bonus content, I might add, these are not people that bought the feature film. These are just bonus content purchases. Um, we have to assume that they also, that they came from iTunes um, or they saw the film in theaters um, or they had already seen the film, you know, uh, through another way. Unfortunately, Apple uh, does not share that data, so we have no idea. Um, you know, the, and, 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 and back to my original point of sort of what you do with that data, uh, the, the filmmakers saw this and, they, re, and you know, what, they, they realized that they could do a lot with this data. They could make really cool infographics and give them to me that I could talk to you guys about or uh, they, could, they could sort of feel great that they put all this content out, but they didn't stop there, uh, they iterated. So they saw, okay, we have an insatiable group of people that wanna buy content from us and they'll buy it at a very high price. So what did they do? They released another special edition with 26 hours of content for $65. And they were able to re-message every single person that bought something on the site, letting them know that it was available. And, uh, and that was recently, so, so we'll have some follow-up data for that um, um, in, in due time. Uh, so I think you know, what you're gonna see here is, is this isn't replacing other stores, right? This isn't saying that you need to just say no to everything out there. You need to put all your stuff exclusively on the internet. You need to do everything exclusively direct. Rather, we're taking advantage of the key part of the internet, which is the relationship that you have with your fan and the direct relationship that you have and using it to monetize, monetize the film. Um, so here is the third point, ubiquity. Uh, this is uh, stripped at the top and these are some other films we worked on. Stripped. 30% of all the income of their entire uh, uh, release came from the website. It was the number one doc on iTunes. They did a worldwide release on the website and on iTunes. Camp Dakota was a film that we worked on earlier this year. It stars three YouTubers, uh, uh, Grace Helbig, uh, Hannah Hart, and Mamrie Hart. They released the film on the website and on iTunes, nowhere else, didn't play a festival didn't do any you know, real traditional press. They marketed directly to their fans. Um, they did a three month pre-order on the website uh, exclusively. Um, and, uh, and we saw when it was released, 50% of the first month sales came from the website. They were the number one independent movie in iTunes and they were the top 10 overall movie in six countries. Uh, about the pre-order, the key there is, is when people pre-ordered on the film, they weren't just pledging money. That is obviously the call to action and that's sort of the symptom of that. But the truth is, they were forming a relationship with the film and with the filmmakers. So because they had those email addresses, they were able to message them. Over those three months, those people were, were getting uh, behind the scenes uh, pictures, they were getting uh, news, they were getting information about the release. We have to stop thinking about the transaction as the conclusion of the relationship. It's actually the beginning. And, uh, and, and Camp Dakota really took advantage of that. And 
if they had all pre-ordered on Amazon or iTunes or Google Play or whatever, that would be great. They'd have that money booked, and that would be, you know, that'd be wonderful. But they couldn't do anything more, and they couldn't use that to further build the buzz around the film, um, which they were able to do in this case. Sound City did the exact same thing. They, they, uh, this is a film that was at Sundance a couple years ago. Dave Grohl directed uh, from the Foo Fighters. They released on all platforms and theatrical after their Sundance premiere. They used their Sundance premiere as their actual premiere and released the film worldwide on February 1st. Uh, it's now one of the top five docs ever on iTunes, and 50% of the first month sales came from the website. They had an audience, they, uh, they leveraged them, and then they also got the benefit of using these other marketplaces. Uh, the pre-order on Sound City was also three months, and they had the incentive of giving those people instant grat special clips uh, uh, for pre-ordering on the website. Indie Game. Another example uh, of, a, of a Sundance film that took advantage of this, they did a worldwide release on the website, on iTunes, and on Steam, which is a, a very popular video game platform. Uh, they did a nationwide theatrical tour ahead of that, um, so they did window their film. They didn't have everything available on the, uh, digitally at the same time. They really wanted to uh, maximize the press and maximize and make sure that all of those screenings were sold out, so they didn't want to leave anything to chance uh, on, the, on the theatrical, but you could pre-order the film on the website during the tour. Uh, they were the number one doc on iTunes. They were number one overall on iTunes. Uh, iTunes, uh, you know, the, these films did really well, and, they, and as a result, got the placement, you know, got the benefit of that. Uh, you know, I think um, you're gonna hear lots of advice when you're, when you're selling your film. Uh, you're gonna hear lots of suggestions about how to price it, how to window it, uh, about exclusive windows, uh, some overpromising, uh, and you know, people like myself and people like uh, other producers or other platforms or other distributors. I think the, the best thing to do is probably just to, to question those base assumptions that we talked about earlier. To step back and to remove all the noise about what works for this film and what works for that film and realize that anything is actually possible. The only thing that matters is what do you have, what is it worth, and how do you get it to the people that want to buy it? Uh, that, does, that might mean using us, it might mean not using us and going all on iTunes or all on theatrical or using traditional distribution, uh, but you really have to just answer those questions for your project. Uh, and I think you know, the key is to bridge that gap between interest and availability. If somebody wants to find your movie and pay for it, they should be able to in, in as easy a way uh, as possible. And we as a company believe that the answer to that lies in software. In, in technology. We're not a media company. We don't buy content. We don't invest in content. You're never going to see a VHX original. Um, you know, we are very much invested in solving these basic problems of how do you connect an artist with a fan with software. And, uh, and, and, good, and good user experiences and good design. Um, you know, I, don't think, I don't think we solve all the problems, um, but I think when, you ha when those things click, you know, really great things are possible. So, thank you. Um, have, a couple, have a couple minutes for questions, uh, if anyone. Go ahead, in the front. Um, so when people buy stuff through VHX, uh, are they downloading it to the computer? Are they streaming it? Is it hosted in a uh, cloud? Yeah, so we, we host all of the video. Um, it, uh, when you buy something on VHX, uh, you don't have to create an account. You type in your email address and a credit card or PayPal, and then you're immediately redirected to a page where it streams and downloads. Uh, we do have the ability to do streaming only, um, but, but it's in one experience, and that's sort of this full browser uh, kind of um, DVD page, if you will. Um, can, would this make sense for short form content? Because it, it, would, it sounds ideal in a way. It sounds, sorry? It sounds ideal in a way for short form content. Yeah, I mean, it, it could. You know, in our experience, short form is harder to, to charge for in some cases because there's so many ways to get it for free. Um, I don't know if the consumer behavior is, is necessarily there, but it depends on the content. I mean, we have seen, you know, we have seen short form content that's performed very well. So um, it really depends on, on, on the actual content and your audience. Over here. Um, I'm really sorry I missed the first part, so this might be a stupid question. I'm actually a digital marketer that helps 
uh, filmmakers connect to audiences. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if that's something, is, is that a service that VHX provides? SEM, SEO, social media strategy between all of those elements to, uh, you know, grow audiences as big as they can for VOD? Yeah, um, not really. Uh, you know, those, we, we do, we, the sites that you build on the platform uh, are SEO optimized. We try to uh, uh, weave as much of that stuff into the software as possible. But in terms of the qualitative, how do I message my fans direct, you know, correctly and if most effectively that isn't, um, we, we, we tend to, to move people to third parties for that. Yeah. Uh, two part question. First is, uh, what is the cost uh, involved with this and are there different tiers, levels and, you know, Things yep. like that. And the other part is, what are you doing about piracy and how, how is it affecting uh, sales? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, so signing up for VHX, using it is completely free. Uh, uh, the only time there's ever a fee is if there is a sale. Um, and that's 10% of the gross and a flat 50 cent transaction fee. So um, any merchant costs, any whatever price it is, are all ca uh, fixed at that amount. Um, there's no cost for bandwidth, there's no sign up fee, there's no recurring fee, there's no membership fee, there's no recoupable cost, and there's no exclusivity. Uh, so, um, so, so we try, and that's, that's the same tier for everyone. Um, philosophically, we are committed to not creating a two tier system and not having a different kind of service for, it, for, for different people. Um, uh, in terms of piracy, um, we tend to think that, you know, for us, the most effective way to, to fight piracy is to fight availability or to fight uh, lack of availability. So being on the official website, someone Googles your movie, they can get it uh, uh, immediately, you know, very, very easily on any device they want, um, you know, tends to, to fight that. I think there's always going to be uh, people that are going to do whatever it takes to, to get something for free. Uh, someone that values their time at zero, they will literally do anything. Uh, but, um, but in terms of sort of the m more people that, that I think would, would have trouble or run into blockers buying it, we, we try and remove those barriers to purchasing and make it easier to buy uh, than it is to steal. Uh, last question. Hi, um, quick question. Would it be possible to get a copy of this presentation or is this private just for presentation only or can we if I was to email uh, you and get a copy of this, is it possible or no? Yeah, you can have you Sure. Uh, just email me at that email address. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>